This week is the second part of Lent, the second part of Lent, which has kind of gotten lost in practice and with a change of customs and times. It was already called Passion Tide. We already entered into this time that prefigures and starts to already signal the passion of the Lord, which we focus on even more during Holy Week. And so, although Holy Week is pretty much Holy Week, it's reserved as the end of Lent, the week before, this fifth week of Lent, was also known as this kind of pre-Holy Week, already putting us into the mindset of the passion of the Lord. We hear it echoed in the first antiphon that we heard at the beginning of the Mass. And then this, we hear it also in the readings. These are now pretty much allusions to the coming persecution of Christ, to that passion, that trial, and his death, and his resurrection are all being prefigured in the Old Testament and the things that Christ himself is, uh, self says in, in, uh, in, the, in, in his time on earth. It, that interesting thing, if we hear again and we recall that antiphon that starts the Mass, it's kind of conflictive. It asks us, Lord, to give us that strength and that perseverance before the injustice of men, before those who try to kill us kind of a very poignant thing. And unfortunately, the antiphon is one of those things that most, many times in many masses that we go to, they just skip it. Uh, I don't know where it was taught that you skip that part of the mass, but um, no, it's part of the mass. You're supposed to say it. Sometimes we all look for a theme of the mass or what is the mass trying to say? Just go to the antiphon. It's right there. That is the theme of the mass right there. And it always goes hand in hand with the readings as we see here. And so we see that struggle, that passion already for portrayed in the Old Testament of being a testimony to the truth. The three young men of Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego who stand before the King Nebuchadnezzar and instead of bowing down to their gods and his decrees, and well, he was the king, he did have authority over them, these three Hebrews decide that they are going to be faithful to the God of their youth, to the God that they have known all their life, even if it means suffering, even if it means their own life. They place ultimate trust in that God. And so they can be sent into the furnace, not with the fear of the suffering that they will endure, because yes, if you're burned to alive, you would feel something and something to fear. However, with that faith, they see that they were saved. And in the same way, starts making an allusion to what Christ himself does. And he enters that cross as he takes up that cross. In a certain way, that cross is the new furnace. And death is the oven. However, that does not finish him. He comes out and even as the king Nebuchadnezzar says, dancing and alive, and looking as if one word is son of God. And that's exactly what it is. That's the promise that he offers us from death. And it's what we prepare ourselves more intensely during this holy week. Before the prospect of death, before the darkness of death, the suffering and the agonizing which certainly accompany it, we have that faith and that trust that will come out through the other end, joyous and glorious as the Lord himself on the day of the resurrection. At the same time, we were reminded in the gospel of that trial, though, that even though it culminates, as we see in the Old Testament, in, the, uh, in that, in that uh, furnace, in that fire, well, there's a trial that precedes it. There's a back and a forth. And here we get a snippet of what Jesus has been arguing with the Pharisees, those Jews who believed that they had the perfect knowledge of God and his law, so much that, well, we can predict God. How well do I know the law that, well, I could now even manipulate things and make them not so much according to what the lawgiver wants, but what I want. And so these Pharisees had, who had become so much experts in the law, the, the law of Abraham, the law of Moses, pretend now that they can manipulate Christ himself, the Son of God. They are so entrenched in their understanding of what they think is the truth that when Christ himself, the truth standing in front of them, is there, they can't recognize it 
because they're so locked in and blinds, blinded by their own, by their own understanding. Perhaps today we again continue to encounter this more and more. It would be the cancel culture or the way we see that we're, we, we've lost that ability to, be, to debate. We've lost that ability to argue intelligently. And so if you do not accept what people call my truth, something that happened, perhaps a phrase that was introduced only to about two years ago on Oprah Winfrey. That phrase has made its way around so many ways, and it's now being acted upon. If you do not accept the truth of someone else, my truth, your truth, their truth, then you can be persecuted for it. And we see it. It's happening already. We might even have experienced it ourselves. And what does one's truth or that vari variable truth would de uh, demand? No one bow down before it, accept it, or at least acquiesce to it, just as the emperor demanded that same acquiescence of the young men. When we have the truth before us, and when we know the truth, and the ultimate truth with this Christ, and the promise of that resurrection, which is the ultimate truth, then we don't bow down to any other truth. We don't bow down to anything that is not consistent to that truth but rather we place our trust wholly on it. And so that we, in trying to show that truth, can be examples of the promise of that truth on the last day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.